Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Of course, most of you homemakers listening in know how deliciously good margarine can be today. But some of you may not have used margarine as a spread for bread for a good many years. Well, if that's the case, you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you taste parquet margarine, the margarine that's made by Kraft. That's because parquet margarine is really different from the margarines of a few years back. First, parquet's flavor is pretty certain to please. It's so delicate and wholesome, so deliciously good. You'll be delighted with parquet as a spread for bread or rolls, yes, and for baking and pan frying, too. Second, unlike old-time margarines, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of vitamin A because every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. And besides, parquet is an excellent energy food. So try economical parquet margarine in your household and find out how extra good it is yourself. Just ask your food dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now on to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. Saturday afternoon finds him in a flurry of preparation for the expected visit of his old friends, Fibber McGee and Molly. For hours, he's been running up and down stairs, issuing orders and countermanding them, and now he pauses to light a well-earned cigar and snatch a moment's respite from the labor of supervising Bertie. Well, Bertie, how do we stand? Has that roast of beef turned up yet? No, sir. I phoned the market, and they said the boy left with about a half hour ago. Maybe he's been hijacked. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll give him a few more minutes. How about the sleeping arrangements? I did like Miss Marjorie said. I'm giving Miss McGee your room. That's right. And Mr. McGee gets the den. I hope he'll be comfortable. He doesn't have to be comfortable. That guy can sleep standing up. <laughs> what about me? Where do I go? <laughs> well, uh, you sort of get the sewing room, Mr. Gilsley. <laughs> I knew at the sewing room I'll be on pins and needles all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sir. I got you all fixed up snug there on Leroy's folding camp cot. Yeah, the last time I camped on that cot, it folded all right. <laughs> Do you remember? Well, I got it fixed up now, Mr. Gilsleeve. I got it tied up with some string. Oh, fine. I'll sleep like a baby. Yes, sir. I'll bet I'll be asleep before my head hits the floor. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, is that you? It's me, Uncle. Huh? Marjorie's coming. She's outside talking to some guy that brought her home from the plant. How was the movie? Uh, Bertie, take this book upstairs with you when you go, will you? Yes, sir. I saw a white cargo. <laughs> it's about this guy. Oh, good. Uh, put that book on the table next to the bed, Bertie. Mrs. McGee might want to read before she goes to sleep. It's about this guy goes to Africa, and he runs into Hedy Lamar down there, mooching around the jungle. Yep. So if the heat begins to get him, only yep. I forgot to tell you, Walter Pigeon is there. He's going in the camp. That's Mr. Miniver, only in this picture his name is Witzel. <laughs> oh, hello, my dear. Hello, my dear. Are they here yet? So, uh, so, so Witzel says to this new guy... Not yet. Their train's due in about a half an hour. So Witzel says to this guy... Witzel, that's Walter Pigeon. Leroy, I haven't got time to listen to all that now. Well, you asked me how was the movie. I'll be more careful next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're early, Marjorie. Yes, I got a ride, so I didn't have to wait for the bus. We picked up Leroy just as he was coming out of the theater. Yeah, tell him who picked you up. Marjorie's got a new fella. Yes. Nobody picked me up. And I have not. That's no way to talk about your sister, young man. One of the men from the plant very kindly offered to drive me home, that's all. He was on his way. Yeah. Mike, she calls him. That just happens to be his name. She's only been there working there a week, and already it's Mike. Hiya, Mike. Hiya, baby. <laughs> oh, come on, now, don't you listen to him. <laughs> very nice, though, really. He works in the drafting department. Oh, well, that's fine. He's a draftsman, all right. If you ask me, he's got designs on our nail. <laughs> Leroy, you mind your own business. I've got something to say to both of you. Yes, Uncle Mort? When Mr. McGee arrives this afternoon, there are two things I want you to be careful not to do. In the first place, I don't want you to make any reference to Fibber's size. What about it? Well, he's a little runt, and like all little runts, <laughs> he's sort of sensitive about it. That's why he's so pugnacious. Oh, I wouldn't say anything, Uncle Mort. Well, I know you wouldn't, my dear, but I'm not so sure about Leroy. <laughs> Did I say anything about him being a runt? You're the one who brought it up. Well, just don't, that's all. 
Actually, he's not so small anyway. It's just that he's not as big as he thinks he is. <laughs> he has the mind of a small man, that's all. <laughs> Always carrying a chip on his shoulder. Oh, we'll be careful, Uncle Moore. And another thing, and this applies to both of you. I'd rather you didn't say anything about my engagement to Mrs. Ransom. Oh, but the McGee's are your friends, Uncle Moore. They'll be offended. We're not announcing the engagement just yet, my dear. We're uh, keeping it a secret. Mrs. Ransom isn't. I heard her talking to Mrs. Pettibone down at the grocery. We're not announcing it to McGee, and that's final, Leroy. Because if I know McGee, he'll start making cracks. <laughs> if he makes any cracks about Lita, I'll punch him in the nose. And if I do that, Molly will be upset, and if she's upset, it'll spoil the whole weekend. And that's what you get for inviting McGee anyway. <laughs> He hasn't had a chance to open his mouth. Well, I know, McGee, his mouth is open right this minute. <laughs> You'll see, he'll arrive here in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> Nobody will be able to get a word in all weekend. If he ever finds out about me and Leela, he'll be like a Scotty with a bone. Oh, Uncle Mort, you're being silly. Well, he isn't going to come in here as my guest and bandy so-called witticisms at my expense. I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. But just keep the whole thing dark, if you don't mind. Come on, it's time to go get him. Can I go, Uncle? Uh, no, Leroy, there's something else I want you to do. What's that? I want you, in the interest of peace, to go out in the garage, get the lawnmower, and hide it. <laughs> well, this is it, folks. It's no palace, but it's home to me. What do you think of it, Molly? Oh, it's a lovely place, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, a nice hunk of property you got here, Gildy. A yeah, hundred foot front by a hundred and seventy-five deep. Well, that ought to give you room to spread out. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see that you have. <laughs> what was that, little chum? McGee, watch it. <laughs> hey, Throcky, uh, who lives next door there? Next door? Oh, some woman. I uh, forget her name. Uh, Mrs. Ransom. R R oh, yes. Is that it? <laughs> She's a widow. Oh, so? Uh, widow woman, eh? Give you much trouble? Uh, no, no. <laughs> As a matter of fact... Marjorie, uh, suppose you run in and ask Leroy to come out and help with the bags. Uh, that's a good girl. You know, I think nice neighbors make all the difference in the world. So do bad ones. <laughs> we had one once who borrowed our lawnmower and kept it so long he finally had to leave town. <laughs> and he took the lawnmower with him. <laughs> McGee, if you've come all the way to Summerfield to open up old wounds... Oh, yes. Come here, my boy. Well, well, this must be little Leroy. Yes. Leroy, I want you to meet Mrs. McGee, a very dear friend of mine. How do you do? My, he's a fine-looking lad, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, and this is Mr. McGee. Hi, bud. Gosh, I had no idea you were such a big kid. Gosh, I had no idea you were so big either. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, you're not such a little runt. I'm told me... Leroy! <laughs> I'm just building him up, huh? Well, cut it out. Never mind him, Leroy. If you eat your oatmeal and cod liver oil regularly, someday you may be as big and fat as your uncle. Are you kidding? None of your impudence, young man. Out, Gildersleeve. The boy meant no harm. He's plainly the victim of an unfortunate environment, that's all. Well, let's go inside, shall we, where the environment is warmer. Oh, yes, by all means. Uh, Leroy, you go get the bags out of the car. Bye, George. I tell you folks, it's wonderful to have you here. This is just like old times. Oh, it's good to be here, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Let me take your coat, Mrs. McGee. Oh, thank you. Where will I put mine, Rocky? Well, I'll take it. Just hang it up here in the hall closet. McGee. What, Molly? You see that closet? That's what I mean. <laughs> Sure, anybody can keep a closet clean <coughs> if they don't use it. Mr. McGee, if you'd like to come upstairs, I'll show the room you're, you're to have. Oh, thank you, dearie. I would like to freshen up a little before dinner. Uh, dinner's in about a half an hour, everybody. Hey, where do these bags go? Uh, Mr. McGee's bag goes in the den, and Mrs. McGee's goes up in my room. Here, I'll take it up to her. Uh, hey, Sonny, is there any place around here where a fellow could buy a toothbrush? I came off without one, as usual. Well, sure, there's a drugstore right down the street about three blocks. Good, I may run down there a little later. 
Well, what have you been doing with yourself all day? I went to the movies this afternoon. Uh-huh. White Cargo, have you seen it? No, that's one I missed. Well, this guy goes to Africa, and he can't stand the heat. Uh-huh. So he and Walter Pigeon get mad at each other, and Walter Pigeon says, you'll quit. And he says, I will not. Uh-huh. So he goes off by himself and plays the photograph, and then he... Well, uh, look, uh, on second thought, maybe I better go right now and get that toothbrush. <laughs> Wait on. I'm just getting to where Hedy Lamar comes in. Oh, well, I'll wait for that. Well, he's playing his phonograph there, yeah. and it's getting all dark and spooky. And he looks out the door, and all of a sudden, what does he see? Eddie Lamar. Yeah, only you'd never know her. Huh? She's got a sort of a thing around her. And she comes in like this. Uh, look, you're Walter Pigeon, and I'm Hetty Lamar. Well, if you're Hetty Lamar, I guess I can pass for Walter Pigeon. <laughs> Shoot the plot to me, Todd. Well, she slides around the edge of the door like this, uh-huh. and she says, I am Tondaleo. <laughs> well, look, Roundaleo, I've got to run down to the corner and get a toothbrush. Hey, wait! I'll be right back. Well, this is the best part. Whistle comes in and catches her. <laughs> Good night. And now, what can I do for you, sir? I'd like to buy a toothbrush. A toothbrush? Mm-hmm. Uh, did you have any particular kind of toothbrush in mind? <laughs> yes, uh, something I could brush my teeth with. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I don't really need a toothbrush. I've got one at home, but I came away without it. Oh, yeah. Uh, none of it's perfect. Uh, <laughs> you say you're a stranger in town? Oh, I didn't say so, but I am. McGee's my name. I'm staying up the street here. Oh, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. McGee. My name is Peavy. Any time I can be of service, only too glad. Oh, thanks. I- I'd like to buy a toothbrush. Any, uh, any particular kind? Co- oh, I asked you that, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Well, I have a number of varieties. I have them in red, green, white, small, medium, large. Now, give me a red one. And uh, then they come in the nylon bristle, the exton bristle, the proton bristle, and uh, the just plain bristle. Look, bud, I just want a toothbrush. I want to brush my teeth. Well, here's a nice brush. I'll take that one. Well, I don't want you to feel I'm high-pressuring you. I, it's just Wrap me. it up. Yes, sir. Uh, will there be anything else? No, that's... Oh, wait a minute. Seems to me Molly did mention something. Oh, I know. We're spending the weekend with a fellow up the street here, and I'd like to get a little something for him as a gift. Uh, what type of gentleman is he? Oh, he's a big, fat blowhard. <laughs> Doesn't do much of anything but eat, sleep, and brag. <laughs> I've got something here that I think uh, Mr. Gildersleeve would like. <laughs> You know him. Oh, yes. He's in here almost every day. Oh. And I think if you really want to surprise him, a nice package of bubble bath would do the trick. Gilder's sleeve in a bubble bath? Boy, he'd look like a blimp coming out of a cloud. Well, of course, it wouldn't make much of a wedding gift, if that's what you have in mind. Wedding gift? For Gildersleeve? Well, haven't you heard? He's engaged to marry his next-door neighbor, Mrs. Ransom. Rocky, engaged? Yeah. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> What'd you say her name was? Uh, Mrs. Ransom. Leela <coughs> Ransom. Widow. Oh, the widow next door. Uh-huh. <clears throat> the one he said he never met. Didn't even know her name. The big fake. What's she like? Well, she's a southern lady. Uh, very well preserved. <laughs> Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Let me at him. Here, what do I owe you? Uh, that'll be 77 cents. Uh, cheapest toothbrush I ever bought. Well, so long, bud, and many thanks. <laughs> Just then, Walter Pigeon comes in from the jungle and catches Hetty slipping in the poison. Heavenly day. Leroy, that'll be quite enough now. Oh, now, don't <laughs> discourage the boy, Mr. Gildersleeve. Discourage him? I only wish I knew how. Hi, <laughs> folks. McGee, where on earth have you been? Oh, just down the corner. <laughs> Say, you look like the cat that swallowed the canary. Do you know that you've kept dinner waiting 15 minutes? Oh, that's perfectly all right. Leroy, run out and tell Bertie she can serve it any time now, will you? McGee, have you washed? <laughs> McGee, what's got into you? Yes, what are you looking at? <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> Hi, Rocky. Yeah. Hello. How's every little thing? How are you feeling? Uh, I feel all right. Why? Everything under control? Certainly. What do you hear from Lulu? <laughs> Lulu? Who's Lulu? McGee, what on earth are you talking? When are we going to meet her, Rocky? Meet who? The Queen of Sheba. Scarlett O'Hara. That widow you're going to marry. Oh! <laughs> Mary? Mr. Gildersleeve? Leroy? Oh, Stock, I didn't say a thing. Marjorie? Not a peep, Uncle Mort, I swear. If you knew Lulu like I know Lulu. <laughs> Her name is not Lulu. No? No, it's Leela. Leela. Lee is saying, leave her out of this, and la is in lots of people get a punch in the nose. <laughs> That's just what you're going to get if you ever so much as... Why, you big bumbling balloon. Come over here, and I'll let the air You muscle bound me. Oh, dinner! Saved by the band. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You know, especially in times like these, it's smart to be economical. But when it comes to food buying, it's important to be wisely economical. To be sure that the economy foods you buy fulfill the requirements of good nutrition. Now, one food that's both economical and highly nutritious is wholesome parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine, you know, is one of the kinds of foods recommended in our government's nutrition food rules. That's because parquet is so nourishing, having both food energy and important vitamin A. And what's more, parquet helps provide these essential food elements in so many ways. It's a delicious spread for bread or toast or rolls. It's a tasty seasoning for hot vegetables. It's a real flavor shortening for baking. And it's grand for pan frying, too. Yes, in all these ways, parquet margarine adds delicious nourishment to meals. So tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. And now, what of the great Gildersleeve? Well, it's Sunday morning, and the great man has come down to enjoy his usual outsize Sunday breakfast. He walks into the dining room, sniffing the air like a bird dog in a hot scent. Uh, uh, that's funny. The stuff must be here, but I can't smell it. <laughs> Birdie? Yes, yeah, Where's breakfast? Why, Mr. Gilby, Miss Marjorie told me y'all would wait until Mr. and Ms. McGee came down. I never heard of such a thing. Marjorie! Yes, for goodness sake, Uncle Morton, now be quiet. Think of our guests. I am thinking of them. I'm thinking, why don't they get up? Oh, the idea. Anyone would think you hadn't eaten for a month. That's exactly the way I feel. And when I think of that little termite McGee, probably lying up there in bed right now, just on purpose to keep me for my breakfast. Who's that? I'll go. Good morning, Judge. Oh, Hooker, come right in. I'm glad to see you. I can't stay, but I've heard the news from Leela Ransom, and as your ex-rival, I simply wish to tender my congratulations. Oh, thank you, Judge. After thinking it over, Throckmorton, I feel sure that Leela's heart has guided her to the right choice. Oh, you think so, eh? Well, I hope so. Uh, by the way, I'm giving a little party for Leela this afternoon. I hope you can come, Horace. I'd love to. I hope you make Leela very happy, Gildy. Well, I'll try. Fine. Uh, Throckmorton, have yeah. you, um... Have you given Leela any kind of uh, token? Uh, token? Well, as a symbol of your plight at draw. It's customary, you know, to give the lady... Hooker, a... are you trying to peddle a second-hand engagement ring? <laughs> no, certainly not. Then what are you talking about? It's not second-hand. <laughs> Leela's never even seen it. This ring has never encircled a human finger. And why don't you take it back to the jeweler? Well, for sentimental reasons, I wanted you to have it. Uh... Besides, I had Leela's name put on it. Oh, well, what'd you pay for it? Seventy-five dollars. I'll give you fifty. It's robbery, but I'll take it. Well, I want to see it first. Well, here it is. Oh, that's quite a flash. Wait a minute, what's this inside of it, this inscription? Oh, yes. To Leela from Cuddles. No, I, thought, I forgot to mention that. Hooker, did Leela Ransom ever call you Cuddles? No, Gildy, but I just hope she'd learn to. Uh, well, obviously the ring is of no use to me, but I'll give you $25 for it. $25? $25, Judge, take it or leave it. I'll take it. But what are you going to do about the inscription? Well, if I play my cards right, she might learn to call me Cuddles. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody around? Hey, don't tell me I'm the first one up. First one up your clavicle. <laughs> I've been up for three hours. I waited breakfast for you till 10 o'clock. 
I'll tell Bertie you're ready. Oh, I've had breakfast, if that's what you mean. If you've had it? Yeah, had breakfast in bed. You... I tell you, it was quite a treat. Things ain't like that around Wistful Vista. Things ain't like that around here, either. <laughs> Bertie! Yes, Gilson? Why don't I ever get breakfast in bed? Because breakfast is the only thing that gets you out of bed, Mr. Gilsey. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, maybe when you're mad, Mr. Gilsley, things will be different. Yeah. You'll have to toe the mark then, Trocky. <laughs> By the way, uh, when are we going to meet Lulu? The name is Leela. Oh, Leela. Excuse me. Uh, when are we going to get a gander at her? What's the matter? You're not ashamed of her, are you? Look here, McGee. You're not even boys, fit to... Boys, boys. So early in the morning? Oh, good morning, Mrs. McGee. i just telling my little chum here I can't wait to have you meet Leela. Well, we can't wait either, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> That's no lie. Yeah. <laughs> She's coming over this afternoon for tea, and I'm having one or two others in. Uh, Judge Hooker. Oh, how are you and the judge getting along these days? Well, we have our ups and downs. Some days I think he's our purest little jurist, and others I think he's a stench to the bench. <laughs> you know, I'm very anxious to meet him, too. He sounds like such fun. Yeah, more fun than a goat. Yeah. McGee, what do you say to a little constitutional before lunch? A little what? A little constitutional, a little walk. On foot? Why, sure. <laughs> I'd like to take you out and show you the reservoir. Go on, McGee, to do you good. How far is it? Oh, only about four miles. Are you kidding? <laughs> McGee, I want you to keep away from Leroy for the rest of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is quite an occasion, quite an occasion. Everybody here now is a guest of honor. Where's Leela, Gildy? Uh, Leela? Oh, she'll be along any minute, Judge. You know, Judge, I've heard a lot about you from our friend Gildersleeve here. Have you? I've heard a lot about you, too, Mr. McGee. Well, I'll tell you what he said about you if you'll tell me what he said about me. <laughs> McGee, you're a guest here. I've never said anything behind your back, little chum, that I haven't said to your face. Oh, so that's the way you talk about me behind my back. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, folks. That must be Leela. I'll go on. Hey, never mind, Leroy. I'll open it. Don't bother us. Oh. Leroy, you hurt me. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I can't wait to meet her. Just think, McGee. Mr. Gildersleeve in love. Yeah. Staggers the imagination. <laughs> Boy, they're taking long enough. <laughs> I wonder what's going on out there. McGee, you stay right here. No, I just thought maybe he needed some help. He doesn't need any help. <laughs> okay. Quiet, here they come. Hey, looks like Gildy done all right for himself. wonder what he used for bait. Uh, Leela, darling, you know most of these people. Oh, yeah. Yes, good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, Leela. Oh, Marjorie, honey, I love your dress. Thank you. Hello, Leroy. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy, uh, my dear, I want you to meet some old, old friends of mine. We're not that old. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. and Mrs. McGee from Whistful Vista. This is Leela. Oh, I'm just thrilled to meet y'all. Drock Martin's told me so much about you. I reckon you must think I'm just terrible carrying him off like this. Dearie, I think it's the finest thing that ever happened to him. And I want to be the first to congratulate oh, you. thank you. Oh, uh, isn't that nice? Well, McGee, aren't you going to congratulate Leela? Why should I congratulate her? It's Gildersleeve that ought to be congratulated. <laughs> Oh, you're just sweet-talking me now, Mr. McGee. Oh, shucks, sis. Just call me Fibber. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gilfrey, excuse me. Could you come out in the kitchen for a minute? Oh, certainly, Bertie. Will you excuse me, folks? Go right on talking. What's wrong now, Bertie? You know, I just can't get over Mr. Gildersleeve after all the years we've known him falling in love. Uh, tell us, dearie, now that it's all over, how did he propose to you? Yeah, did he get down on his knees? And if he did, who helped him up? McGee. <laughs> Now, this is just between us women. Well, it was terribly romantic and all. It was in the evening, and he came with a beautiful bunch of roses. Oh, sure. You hear that, dearie? Roses he brought her. What's the matter? I bought you some roses a couple of anniversaries ago. <laughs> well, I just want you to make a note of it. Oh. Go on, dear. Well, I, I remember I just happened to be wearing a gown that he particularly liked. <coughs> a, a flowered chiffon, very tight through here with a long flowing skirt. I'd been planning to spend the evening with a good book. Go on, you'll get plenty of time for that later. <laughs> 
uh, we were standing there together arranging the flowers, and all of a sudden, right out of the blue, he said, well, I don't know that he'd like me telling you, but he said, what would you do if I was to steal a little kiss? Oh, my God. <laughs> Is that corny? <laughs> Keep out of this, McGee. You don't understand. And then what? Well, naturally, I tried my utmost to discourage him, but it seemed like he just refused to take no for an answer. Oh, not only that, he started to chase me around the room. <laughs> Throckmorton, I couldn't understand it. Uh, look, Leela, uh, when did you first begin to suspect that uh, something was cooking? <laughs> Just a little love, a little kiss. Just a little love. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Is everybody happy? What's going on, folks? Hey, what's the big joke? Nothing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Nothing at all. McGee, go on outside till you can control yourself. Come <laughs> on, get out of here. Oh, I hear any more of us. Leroy, show me where I get a glass of water, will you? <laughs> Leela, what's wrong with McGee? I don't know, Throckmorton. I was just telling them about our engagement and how you proposed to me, and uh, all of a sudden something seemed to strike him funny. Leela is nothing sacred to you. Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, don't be blaming her. Is our romance nothing but a farce to be torn to tatters for the amusement of the mob? Oh, no, Throckmorton. Am I nothing to you but a laughing stock? Oh, well, that's the impression I seem to get. Now, listen, don't be blaming it on her, Mr. Gildersleeve. Blame it on McGee. Huh? And now, listen, remember, every proposal is sweet to the woman who hears it. Mm, isn't that a fact? Uh, tell me, Mrs. McGee, how did Mr. McGee propose to you? McGee? <laughs> <laughs> well, dearie, McGee proposed in a leaky canoe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Which he had to paddle with his mandolin because he lost the paddle. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. And the song he sang to me was Pretty Red Wing. Yeah, Pretty Red Wing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this Summerfield water tastes a little funny, doesn't it, Gildy? It does not. You can say what you want to about me, McGee, but Summerfield has the finest water in the country. McGee, stop picking fights. You've made enough trouble already. Who's uh, picking fights? I just made a simple observation, that's all. Well, you're a bad boy. Come over here. Come on. I want you to apologize to Mr. Gildersleeve. Go on, tell him you're sorry you hurt his feelings. Okay. Throcky, old chum, I'm sorry. Uh, well, that's all right, McGee. I know you're sensitive, and it's only natural. And I want to take this opportunity to say that where you're concerned, old chum, there's only one thing in this world I want. Oh, uh, what's that? Just a little love, a little <laughs> Well, it's certainly been, been nice having you folks here, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> well, it's, it's been nice being here, Mr. Gildersleeve, and meeting Marjorie and little Leroy and Leela and all. I think Leela's going to make you very happy. Yeah, Throcky, she seems like a mighty nice gal. Well, I'm glad you both liked her. Well, goodbye, old chum. Thanks for the use of the den. Oh, yes, I hope you were very comfortable there. Oh, it was fine, but there's just one thing I'd suggest, Throcky. Huh? If you go to take a shower there, be careful. Why? You might cut your feet on my lawnmower. Oh! <laughs> Leroy! Good night. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Yeah. Harold McGee and Molly appeared on this program to the courtesy of the makers of Johnson's Wax. Original music was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the makers of Kraft Cheese and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Six o'clock, Mother's late. That means the family will have to wait for dinner. But they won't wait long if Mother's smart and knows the seven-minute way to make macaroni and cheese. The trick is performed with a product called Kraft Dinner. Yes, folks, that amazing food product called Kraft Dinner gives you delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. A package of Kraft Dinner contains a special kind of macaroni that cooks up fluffy and tender extra fast. And the Kraft Dinner package also holds some Kraft Grated. 
This craft grated, sprinkled through and through the macaroni, gives it good cheese flavor in a twinkling. No time used up preparing a cheese sauce or baking the macaroni either. Keep Kraft Dinner handy for luncheon or dinner emergencies. And folks, you can help your dealer with this problem of keeping in stock by ordering Kraft Dinner early in the week. This program